One thing to think about is the order of verse nine. And Isaac and Yishmael, his son, his sons buried him, right? So, right on this, in the art scroll, it's page 123. His sons, Isaac and Yishmael, buried him. What is interesting about that order? If Rashi says anything. Yes, so Rashi does say something. Yitzchak and Yishmael. There has been an ongoing dispute or tension in the family between Hagar and Sarah, who is Avram's proper heir, who's the firstborn. And Yishmael thought, or Hagar thought, that her son um, Yishmael was Abraham's heir, whereas Sarah, that's why she wants to expel, that's why Sarah wanted to expel Hagar and Yishmael, because she says she doesn't want um, Yishmael to inherit with her son. In other words, to show that Yitzchak, her firstborn, even though Abraham's second firstborn, but Sarah's firstborn is indeed the Abraham's uh, proper heir. So here at the burial, it says that Isaac and Yishmael says Isaac first. So the fascinating Rashi, I'm reading the Rashi on the screen. Isaac and Yishmael says Rashi, quotes the Medrash, Genesis Rabbah. From here, we, we may deduce that Yishmael repented and, the, and let Isaac go before him, right? In other words, Yishmael allows Isaac to go first. In other words, Yishmael acknowledges that Isaac is the true heir. And, and Rashi says that he, does, he did teshuva. So if he did teshuva means what was the sin? The sin was that he thought that he is um, the true, Abraham's true heir. And here he acknowledges after the passing of Yishmael, after the passing of Abraham, we acknowledge he acknowledges that it's it's really it's really Isaac, and that that and, and Rashi continues, and that is the meaning of a good old age, which is stated regarding Abraham. Um, a few port was it last portion, uh, two portions ago, Lech Lecha. You have the covenant between the parts, and the covenant between the parts, God tells Abraham about the future exile, that you should know that your descendants will be enslaved for four hundred years. And then they will come out and with great possessions. So in other words, that's, that's a pretty harsh uh, statement. In other words, a, a prophecy. But God tells Abraham, don't worry. He says, you, you, he says, you, meaning Abraham, he says, you're going you're gonna to be gathered to your parents, meaning you'll pass away in good old age. So what does it mean good old age? Simply means you'll live long. But what does good mean? What is good life? Not just a life, not just a long life, but a good life. So good life means that Rashi says that he merits that his Yishmael also repents. Just, Go ahead. Remember we studied this earlier in the week about inheritance? Yes. It's not necessarily uh, like size of your family or size of the tribe. Right. But they get it. They, the size of the inheritance is based on the reward of how you you mean you're referring to the inheritance of the land of Israel, right? The land that was that was it, divided. It seems like all the inheritances are based on reward. Right. Of how the person or right. So here I wouldn't behave. so you could talk about reward in this context. I would say not so much reward, but it's more who is the person who is going to take the responsibility for the legacy. It's not just inheritance. Oh, you're, you, we like you the best. You're the oldest son. You're the best. You're the most handsome. So we'll give you a double portion. It's not the way it works. In biblical times, it was understood that the person who's the, who's the, the, the heir is the person who has responsibility toward the legacy. So for example, we know that the Torah tells us that the laws of, of, of inheritance is that the firstborn gets a double portion of the, of the estate. So let's say a person has four children. Um, a person passes on, you divide the estate into five, firstborn gets two, two portions and everybody else gets one. Okay, so why? Why, what did the firstborn do? Why, why does he get a double portion? Because he's, because he's first, so what? So favorite, it's not fair. So the understanding is that, at least in that culture, the firstborn, if the, if the parents pass on, it was the firstborn's responsibility to take the father's place and worry for the family. But so if they didn't do that. So then if they didn't do it, then they don't, then, then that, they shouldn't be entitled to the to the estate. But in other words, the image, or in other words, the role, the role of the firstborn, if someone had a problem in the family, they were supposed to go to the firstborn. And therefore they don't get an extra portion because we like them. We get an extra portion because they have an extra responsibility. You know, my, my, you know, we were growing up in Crown Heights, so we had my 
my we used to go to my grandparents' house, and every holiday, every Hanukkah, you go to their, their their grandparents. So fine, so my grandfather passed away, so we continued going to my grandmother's house. So my, then my grandmother moved; she came to our house. Then the question is: So what are you going to do the Hanukkah party? It's not just the Hanukkah party. We have we have family around the world; they all come to Brooklyn. So where are they going to stay? Is it going to be my mother? Is it going to be my aunt? Right. So without getting into politics and telling you what happened in our family, it's a very serious thing. Who's going to who's going to worry about the family? Who's going to feed everybody? It's going to come a holiday. We have to invite all the guests, all the family from all over the world, all coming to Brooklyn. Who's going to feed them? Who's going to clothe them? Who's going to take care of them? You know. So then the so, so someone steps up. So the role was for the firstborn. So that's why you get a double portion. Now, when you're talking about with Abraham and and Isaac and Ishmael, they each had their own lifestyle. They weren't going to change. Ishmael has his his lifestyle, which. Mm-hmm. Esau has his lifestyle, but Yishmael will get to Esau later. We don't want to complicate it. We have enough trouble right now dealing with the first generation. Second generation is just more and more, more difficulty. But we'll get to that because the Torah now alludes to some of Yishmael's lifestyle and, and his way of serving God, which is wonderful. But the question is, is this, is this Abraham's legacy? Or is Abraham's legacy Isaac? And that's why when, when Abraham sends away everybody and he says, and he keeps, Yishmael, he keeps Isaac, and then Yishmael shows up and he says, yes, I know, I, Yishmael, I receive Abraham's legacy. In other words, I'm influenced by Abraham. And therefore, the Yishmael and his descendants believe in the one God and because they keep Abraham's legacy. But they still don't have what Isaac has, as we'll explain in a few moments. And therefore, when he acknowledges that, no, you're the true heir, that is, that, that is, that is his teshuva, that is his repentance, as opposed to saying that I represent Abraham in this world, and that would be a little bit of a problem. Well, I, don't no, Go ahead. No, I don't understand what Ishmael had to So we know that he was chased out of, he was sent away from Isaac's home, right. from, 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 from Abraham's home. So we assume that was some sort of sin. What was the sin? What did he do wrong? What did Ishmael and Hagar do wrong? It says that, Yishmael, that, that Sarah saw Ishmael was mitzachek, was laughing, was, was, was being... Uh, frivolous with Isaac. What does that mean? So this medrash, you don't want to go to the medrash because medrash has all kinds of interpretations because the word mitzachek has negative connotations in the Bible. So there's all kinds of interpretations of how Yishmael was because Yishmael did things wrong because you have to just you have to justify. People want to justify why Sarah would want to get rid of Yishmael and why God would agree with Sarah. Right. So it must be that the, what he did is very grievous, gri- gri- grievous. Is that a word? Egregious. 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 I don't know if it belongs here. In any case, but the point here is one way, the way to diminish the sin is to say that he, didn't, he wasn't so bad, but he still can't be in Abraham's home, is that the sin is that the claim is that I'm the heir, that my lifestyle represents Abraham's uh, uh, legacy. And Abraham is very happy. This, 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 is, this, is, this, is the, this is the ultimate you could live. The, the, my lifestyle is the ultimate you can grow. Um, um, within Abraham's, uh, Abraham's legacy. In other words, you, you're, I don't want to say a good Jew, you're a good Abrahamic person if you live my lifestyle. And the reality is, no, you have to do more. You have to be more like Isaac, as, as we'll discuss. So that's the sin. Is it a big sin? No. But, it's a, but, the sin, but the reason why he was sent away, because he claimed, because he claimed that he's the heir. So if that's the sin, and that's what he was sent away. So when you say teshuva, teshuva is repentance, returning. Returning from what? Right? So returning doesn't have to mean... Depending on the sin, that's what the returning looks like. And so in this case, if the sin was claiming that I'm the heir, then the repentance is allowing Ishmael, to, allowing Isaac to go first. Even though he's older, look at the passport, he's older. But he's the son of Hagar, the maidservant, not the son of Sarah. So that's, that, that's the tshuva. Go ahead. I'm just curious, how, how, how old was Ishmael when this was born? 14. Because it says that, that when, when Abraham... Um, Abraham, am I getting this right? 14. Why, why 14? I thought he was 13. No, he was 13 when he, when he, he circumcised himself. But then, oh, that's why. So he was 13 when he was circumcised. And, but then Abraham was circumcised and Isaac was born exactly a year after Abraham was circumcised. Because if you remember, the three angels came to visit Abraham after the circumcision. And then they said, in one year, we're going to return and you're going to have a son. So it turns out that it was one year after the circumcision. And we know the circumcision. We know that, 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 um, that we know that the Torah does say explicitly, actually, you don't even need this math. I believe the Torah says that Abraham was 86 years old. I believe, I'm dreaming, but I think it says 86. 
which would mean 14 years later, um, and Yishmael was 13, and and uh, 14, and we know that Isaac was born when he was 100, so he's 14. I'm almost positive that that's the case. Yeah, the Torah says clear. No, what am I saying? What am I saying? 86. What am I saying? I'm getting confused now. I'm getting confused. Abraham was 99 when he circumcised himself, of course. Yishmael was Yishmael was 13 years old. 86 is the age that 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 Yishmael was born. When Yishmael was born, Abraham was 86. I I'm pretty sure Torah says so explicitly. That may be wrong. Yeah, Avram ben Shmoinim, Shana b'shei Shanim. Yeah, there's an explicit verse. The last, um, if you look in the article, 73, chapter 16, verse 16, and Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Yishmael to Abraham. And we know that the verse says later that Abraham was 100 when Isaac was born. And he circumcised at 99, 14 years old. So he's 14 years older. So you think, let him go first at the funeral. So he says, no, the fact that the verse says, it's not a mistake. You really quickly would have noticed, but Rashi says, that the fact that the verse says, who buried him? Isaac and Yishmael, that's significant. And that represents Yishmael coming back. And that's the good old age. That's the beauty, beautiful part. What does it mean that Abraham, Abraham has a good old age? Doesn't mean that he lives long and he can play golf for many years. It means that he sees Yishmael coming back, and that's and that's and that's the seva toiva. That's the that's the good old age. Go ahead, Vicky. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Vicky, and then Neil. Um, yeah, thank you, Rabbi. I, I had a question about your comment that um, that wasn't such a big sin that um, Ishmael didn't understand that uh, what. He is not representing the legacy. So it may look like not such a big sin, but uh, it means that he doesn't understand that what he's do he was he was doing and is doing is not exactly right. So that that I think includes everything that he did in the past, right? Correct. I just mean that it's not a, it's not a sin it's like not murder. It's not a sin like adultery. That's what that's what that, these are the other possibilities that the Medrash mention, mentions because. The word mitzachek, the Medrash quotes of the word mitzachek, that the verse that it says there that he was bring, bring, bring frivolous, the Medrash, the Medrash points out that that word is always used in negative connotations, either, either, either idolatry or adultery or murder. So it's a pretty harsh word. So, so there are ways to read that word in a much more severe way. So I'm saying that you can read it simply and say that the sin is that he claims that he's the heir and the repentance, what we see with the repentance is according to Rashi, the repentance is that he acknowledges that Isaac is there, is the heir, that's the repentance. Well, my question was about um, like what he's capable of understanding and what his repentance is about, because if he's not capable of understanding and admitting that he what he was doing is wrong, um, his repentance is not gonna be sincere. So that's right, my question. Right, right. but the I think the fact that he lets him go first is an acknowledgement. Remember that the conflict is who's first. The conflict is who's considered Abraham's firstborn. That's the conflict. So the actions speak louder than words. Right, if he would, if he'd write a letter in the in the New York Times, it's one thing. But the fact that he let him go first at the funeral, that is that is uh, that is the proof, I guess. I guess that's what Rashi is saying. It's an indicator. In other words, that there's a maybe more happened, but the verse is it, we know we did teshuva. Where's that indicated in the verse? It's indicated at the funeral. That's where you see. That's where, that's where you see. Um, you go to funerals, you learn a lot about families, who's talking to who, who's in a fight, who's, who's, who likes, who, whatever, you learn a lot. So that this, this story that, uh, that uh, he lets Isaac go first, that's, that's telling. It's not just um, a detail. It's not just a seating arrangement. No, it's, it's significant. Go ahead, Neil, please. Um, is there either in the Torah or in the Midrash a concept that Jacob gave a double portion to Abraham? And Jacob himself? When he died, did he, when he yeah. did his inheritance? When Jacob gives a double portion, it, if he gave anyone a double portion, he would give it to Joseph. And he does not to, so, Judah. Not to Judah. He does so, does, he, he considers, he blesses Judah, but he does so to Joseph in the sense that he splits, he splits the, 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 the Joseph into two, he gives him two tribes. So in that sense, that's like a double portion. So you did It's re his reward for being. At least it's a reward, is. but it's also a, a, a it's also giving responsibility. Who do you give the responsibility to? The one who, who does it, right? 
that it's sort of it's sort of it's sort of the person who's dedicated to the family you would give them you would give them the you would give them the the reward the, the second level portion because you assume they're going to continue look at joseph case in point right joseph obviously more than all the other brothers was worried about the entire family sustaining the entire family as opposed to the other brothers who tried to sell him but he when he got the power he that's what he did he sustained his family for many years so there's no so now you have to say so who's going to get the the double portion? It wasn't literal there. It wasn't a physical estate, but it was more of a figurative. But who gets who gets the the symbol of being the firstborn? Even though he was he was the firstborn for Rachel, not Leah, but he was his mother's firstborn. Whatever the case, but who gets that sign? The person who sows the devotion is the one that uh, is the one that that get, that will get that will get the 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 blessing and the responsibility to continue. I don't want to bring up the story of, of, of Asa, but I'm just going to bring it up for one second. Just going to get in and get out. The story is that, that J Jacob is uh, making a stew and Asa comes in and he's tired and he's going to have some food. And Jacob says, no problem. I'll give you soup. I'll give you the, 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 the lentils if you sell me your, 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 your birthright. Now, without, just with reading that story, it sounds very um, Cunning, like like the guy's hungry, you're taking advantage of a hungry person. The guy's hungry, he's starving, he probably didn't eat in a week, and you're taking advantage, making him sell the birthright. It's it's just not right on, on on Jacob's part. But the way the sages read the story is that why is he making the lentil soup? Because they're they're in mourning. They're in mourning for Abraham. Abraham passes away. They're mourning for Abraham. And um, they're mourning for Abraham, and everybody is mourning. Now, the firstborn of that generation, Esav, should do what at the Shiva? Making lunch for everybody. But instead, what, what is he doing? He's out playing. So Jacob is the second one of the family. He now is making soup. He's not making soup for himself. He's making soup for all the mourners. So he's taking the role. So now Esav shows up. Not only doesn't he say, okay, let me help with the moving the chairs and feeding the people. He says, could you serve me? So he says, I'm happy to serve you. But if you're not acting like the firstborn, then you have to give me not just the responsibility, but also the privilege. So at least that, that sweetens the deal. Now we at least understand what, what, what you know, the poor brother comes in, he's hungry, you start telling, telling me, tell me your firstborn. But it means Aesop doesn't want that responsibility. Now we can sit, sit in Aesop all day, I don't want to spend, I don't want to spend the next uh, 38 minutes on Aesop, but you see the point. The point is that in the, in, the, in, the, in the biblical times, the firstborn meant you have certain rights, but it also more than that, it means you have responsibility to the legacy. And to the family, and to and 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 to perpetuate the teachings. So that's 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 a responsibility. Okay, I just want to read an interesting, interesting commentary by Nachmanides, Ramban. So if you look at, if you look at the, the, the description of Asaph's pass, of, of uh, Abraham's passing, okay, so it says, it says verse eight, and the article called page 121, verse eight, and Abraham expired and died at good old age, mature, literally Zakain is old, mature or old, and content, the Sabea satisfied right that's the first word on the 123 second word um and he was gathered to his people so he was he was mature meaning old and satisfied the question is what does satisfied mean so nachmanides has a very interesting interpretation he says like this righteous people who are not don't desire physical things so when they when, so, so they so they pass they, they pass on they're satisfied but King Solomon says that most people, he says, King Solomon says, He says, if somebody loves money, will never be satisfied. The physical things, the more you have, the more you want. So most people, when they die, the Talmud says, when a person dies, a person, uh, what's well, the Medrash really? The Medrash says that most people, when they die, they only die with only half of their desires in their hand. In other words, if you have a bucket list, most people can only do 50% of the bucket list. <laughs> Because why? No matter what you have, you, the desire grows. But the fact that you say that Abraham is content, passes away and he's content, says Nachmanides, that means that, he, that, that that represents the fact that he has that wisdom and the maturity that he's not looking for necessarily the physical 
physical uh, pleasures and physical wealth because the physical pleasures and wealth will never satisfy somebody. For someone who's satisfied is because they're in touch with the spiritual side of self, and that's yeah. and that brings the satisfaction. Maybe you felt though, when people who are satisfied have done what they wanted to do in their life, whether it's money or not. Maybe you just felt yes, I, I did a good job, I succeeded, I tried my best to please a chair. I yeah, so did. so I did a very so, like so that. the people are like that. People get, but that that comes from spiritual things. The person ultimately could be satisfied by spiritual things, by meaningful things. Just pleasure would never satisfy. That's the argument of Nachmanides based on the argument of King Solomon. Some people say otherwise. Some say, no, I'm, I'm 100 years old. I'm dying. dying. I, did, I fulfilled my entire bucket list. I did everything I wanted to do. I went bungee jumping all the times I wanted to go. I'm fine. I'm good. But na naturally, it doesn't really work that way because really what brings people satisfaction is the meaning. As opposed to if I'm just about pleasure, then then then, it, then as King Solomon says, somebody who desires um, money will never be satisfied because however much you want, you have much you have, you want more. If you're able to be content, it's because there's also a spiritual element, because the spiritual element is, is what brings the contents. I'm just going to apologize because my phone is ringing off the hook. It's probably my children who um, don't have anything. You know, I don't know. Just want to make sure it's not an emergency. Hello. Can. Can. <laughs> Some wonderful people. Okay, I'm going to call you back in a little bit. Can. Can. Okay, no problem. I'm sure this was an emergency. I'm, just not, I'm still not sure what the emergency was, but uh, okay, I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay, so that's the idea here. We're saying that the content, if you're satisfied, if you're content, what does that tell you? In other words, what does that tell you about, about what's gonna, what, what your values are? And I also wanna say that you don't have to wait until your Abraham's age, which was, which was what, 175? You also could look earlier and say, so what is going to make me content, right? It's going to make me content is the meaningful spiritual part of life. And therefore, you have that in your life. And therefore, at the end of your life, you're, 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 you're content. Okay. Another interesting interpretation here is also talk about mourning. And this is very interesting. This is from the al Sheikh, which was a 16th century Kabbalist. He lived in Svat. So this is actually an interesting, an interesting perspective. If you look at verse... 11, page 123. So the verse states as follows. Um, let's see if I can share the screen. I never knew E means me. Im, where are you looking at? Im be'er Im be'er Roy. Roi. Shouldn't it say Allah? Yeah, together with. The together with could mean, could be translated. Im is together with. But what does together with mean? Does it mean we're walking someone together or it means we're in close proximity, right? So in English, you would say, you would say, you would say near. But in Hebrew, there's all kinds of ways to do doing that. So for example, in, in Hebrew, when you want to say someone is near the well, it says he's standing on the well, al ha'ayin, right? So there are different ways of, of saying near. You could say on top, you could say, you could say together with. Right? In English, we don't have that, that, those expressions. So what is, uh, what is um, al-yad mean? Al-yad, literally, if you want to go literally, I, I'm just trying to think, is al-yad the biblical term? Liyad. Literally, I guess it comes from the word from the hand, from next to your hand. Uh, on, the hand. on the hand, but if I'm, or, or liad. So if I'm- It's like your hand's distance. It could be that, or it could mean if, that if I'm, 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 I'm taking it from your hand, we're close enough, we're close enough to, 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 to um, handshake. handshake or transfer something. But liad, eight cell is not, I don't know how common uh, um, liad is. 
in biblical Hebrew. I'm sure, I'm sure it exists, but I don't know how common. In, in, you'll have in the Bible, for example, eight cell next to. Eight cell. Eight cell, like, like eight cell. In modern Hebrew, you may say eight cell, eight cell. And you're like, eight cell, eight cell, eight cell. I don't know how they pronounce it. Doesn't eight cell mean like, um, you say, in modern Hebrew, what's it mean? What does it mean in modern Hebrew? If you come, it's lame. It means... uh, next to us. It's Lenu, as the root is Eitzel, next to us. You, you use it as coming to us, but, but really it means next to us. You come into my dining room table, you're, you're, you're with us, but you're really next to us. So they, they list Ishmael's descendants. Oh, not yet. We'll get to that soon. We'll get to that. We'll get to verse 12. That's verse 12. We're going to get to that soon. The E means together. We say together with. So there's a whole thing with together. The together is a, is a very fascinating word. We'll take, we'll, we'll, let's talk about this for a second. Go back to Parshas that we read a few weeks ago, Balak. There's a strange story. And the story over there is that God tells that, 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 that um, Balak wants to hire Bilam to curse the Jews. And God says, don't go. And then says, because they're blessed. Then God says, oh, you want to go, go. So he goes. As soon as he goes, um, um, as soon as he goes, as soon as he goes, God is angry that he went. So it's a very big question. Why is God angry if God himself said he can go? There's all kinds of interpretations. My favorite interpretation is that there are two Hebrew, biblical words. God said, for, for with, God says, kum lech itam. Go get up and go with them, itam. What Bilam did is a different biblical word. It says he went im, but im with an ayin, and not itam, but imam. So not, not, not itam, but imam, different word. I would never know the subtlety. But the Malbim says like this. He says that in biblical Hebrew, what does it mean I'm going with? Going with could be physically. We're both walking in the same direction. We're both walking on the same path. We're taking the same tra- train ride. <laughs> That's, we're going, we're going, we're going with, that's one with. Another with is, but on the other hand, there's another, a much deeper connection is we're going with, means we're going for the same purpose. You could be on the same train, you're going to a funeral, I'm going to a wedding. Are we, are we, are we with each other or not? Well, physically, yes, but men, mentally and emotionally, no, it's not, we're not going for the same purpose. On the other hand, if we're two people going for the same purpose, then you would say they're together because they really are together. So the Malbim says that when God says to to Bilam, go with the messengers of Bilam. He says, Kum lech itam, with them. But with them means go with them, go on the donkey with them, go together with them, but don't have the same intention. Imam is a much deeper word. Imam means you're with the other person, not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally. And that's when, when God saw that Bilam is going with them, meaning with the same intention to curse the Jews, then God was upset because God never told him to go Imam. God says itam. What I'm trying to say is that in biblical Hebrew, there's so many words for it, for together and next to, because it could be just physical or it could be mental or emotional. How, how close are we? It's because we're sitting together and, lo- and, and looking at each other. We can be physically close, but spiritually distant or, 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 or intellectually or emotionally distant, or we could be together and be, be very close. So that's why you have a range of words. So just repeat what is em mean again, together? Em is together with the same intention. And Etam with you. I'm going with a lot of people. I'm, I'm riding the train. I'm, I'm going with 700 people on the train. Am I, am I close to? Am I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going with them. All right, we get onto a plane. We say we're going to, we're going, we're going to Italy. Are we going? Are we going together? And I mean, yeah, together. We're together, in some sense. But are we going for the same intention? And we have the same. Is there an inner connection between us? No. It's just, it's just, it's just uh, the fact that physically we're going together. What I'm trying to say is that there, that there are multiple words. That's just an example. I don't know the difference in eight cell and this and that. I mean, we can think about it, but my point is that it, in biblical Hebrew, there's a subtlety and there's a reason for every word. In English, you have multiple words because it's just a challenge for multiple languages, right? So not necessarily is there, is there a reason, um, but in biblical Hebrew, multiple words for the same point is because there's, there's, a, there's a range, there's a spectrum. Of what, does it mean, what does it mean to be with somebody, to be close to somebody, to go, to go with someone? What does with mean? Right, so there's a range. So that's that's the subtlety. Go ahead, Vicky. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, I just want to 
let you know that I enjoyed your conversation about meaning of the words in Hebrew. It's so enlightening because there is so much depth in there. Uh, so I also was thinking about the word that um, that you mentioned earlier, satisfied by the end of the life. Yeah. So okay, if it's satisfied. yeah, so if it's um, if it's uh, satisfaction during the life, doing make, making sure that you're doing something right and, and you get satisfaction from that. But at the end of the life, I think satisfaction should come from the um, certainty that your spiritual legacy goes in the right direction. So uh, it probably tells us that he that uh, Abraham was satisfied with the role that I uh, that that um, right right. Right. Just with each each of each of the children will will play. So he was happy with everything that he is leaving, like about his spiritual legacy. Right? Is it the same word? I think it's the same idea. In other words, if at the end of my life I evaluate my life based only on physical, so then there's always again a human nature. Maybe some people are the exception, but at least according to King Solomon, human nature is. I always say, oh, I could have, I could have, I could have done more. I could have made more money. I could have, I could have had more fun. I could have, you know. So, 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 but what's satisfying is the spiritual side of life. And you're right. So the legacy is part of the, what brings you the satisfaction. All I'm saying this is not that we shouldn't have to wait till we're 175 years old, but we should have the insight and 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 invest in what's satisfying even when we're younger. It's just good right. Advice. Yeah, my, my question was more about was he actually uh, satisfied with the way his spiritual legacy is going with those two children? So exactly. each will go in its own in, in his own direction. Like right. and, but yeah. he's he was satisfied, he was content at the end I of think his so, life that everything was going right. Right. Rashi also told us, as I mentioned before, that that when God says you're gonna you're gonna go to your father's um um the save a table with good old age, good old age means that he saw that Yishmael does teshuva. So in other words, yes, the fact that his, his legacy, both Yishmael and Isaac um, were repented, so to speak, then that was satisfying. Let's just clarify again, which I said many times, Parashan, I said it again and again and again. There's a big difference between Abraham and Sarah and their spiritual pur purpose in life is different. Sarah is the matriarch of the Jewish people and her job was to protect the, the creation of a unique um, nation. And that's why she was very protective over her son, Isaac. Whereas Yishmael, uh, Abraham, that wasn't Abraham's only mission. That was part of it. Abraham happened to be a patriarch. He was also a patriarch of the Jewish people. But, it, but Abraham's mission was to be a father of a multitude of nations, to influence a multitude of nations. And influence doesn't mean make them convert to Judaism, right? Influence means teach them about the oneness of Hashem. And how do they celebrate the oneness of Hashem? Different than the way we do. We have commandments, we have discipline. We'll get to the discipline in a minute, right? So Abraham's responsibility is to influence even the people who are not Jewish. That's not Sarah's responsibility. Um, we talked about this in the beginning that this whole parsha is called Chai Sarah, the life of Sarah, even though it's referring to the time of after her passing. So why would you name a, parasha, a portion of the life of Sarah if it's, we're not talking about Sarah's life? So the answer is because this entire parsha up to this last verse, the last verse we read, that Yishmael lets Isaac go first. This first, this parsha is talking about the legacy of Sarah, which is the uniqueness of Isaac. So almost everything in this parsha highlights the uniqueness of Isaac. But if you're talking from Abraham's perspective, Abraham's perspective, Abraham has a moral responsibility to all of his children and to all the people of the world, because that's what the, his his message is universal. Because that's what God tells him when he adds the extra hey, Avraham and Goyim, you're a father of a multitude of nations. Thank you. Okay, a beautiful verse. This is a Kabbalistic verse, but it's about it's about mourning and about comfort. So I want to say it. I'll read it from. I'll do my best to read it from from uh, Al Sheikh. But let's look at. Let's first read the verse. So the verse is here. She can get in. She knows how to get in. I think the verse reads. Um, now it came to pass after Abraham's death that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt near the heir Lachai Roi. Okay, so God blessed Isaac, his son, or his son Isaac. So let's start with Rashi. What does it mean? Did I share it? Yeah, I shared it. Yeah, what does it mean that God blessed? Did it share? Yeah, sure. 
What did God, what does it mean that God blessed Abraham? Um, I'm, I'm Isaac, his son. So Rashi's. Ra you need your call. Thank you so much. Sorry. Amazing. Thank you, Seth. I can't read. <laughs> 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 okay so what are we talking about we're talking about oh what blessing did god give isaac so rashi says he consoled him with the con con consolations of the mourners that's the first interpretation so we have another interpretation in other words yitzchak is mourning so you are mourning the mitzvah is to, to comfort the mourner that's what abraham does that's what god does does for isaac that's the meaning of i of god blesses his son isaac because what's the blessing? We don't see any blessing. I mean, God, I mean, Abraham is the a blessing. Isaac will be blessed later. What's, what's the blessing at this point? So that's the first interpretation. The second interpretation, another explanation, even though the Holy One blessed, he delivered the blessings to Abraham. He was afraid to bless Isaac because he foresaw Esau emanating from him. So he said, may the master of blessings come and bless whomever he pleases. And the Holy One blessed be he came and blessed him. Interesting. The Medrash says that Abraham was afraid, was afraid to bless Isaac. But after Abraham's passing, Isaac, God blesses Isaac. But in any case, let's stay with the first one because I want to stay on, on, the, on the theme of comforting the mourners. God blesses um, Isaac, his son, meaning God comforts the mourner. Okay, go ahead, Neil. I'm sorry, could you just repeat what the first person was the company in the mourners? Yes, Nichamu Tenchume Avela. He consoled him with the consolations of the mourners. So it uses the term blessing, but what, what is blessing? So blessing is a, a general term. Blessing can mean different things. So in this context, Rashi says, thank you. Rashi says that blessing means the, 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 the blessing of comfort. That's what Rashi says. Okay, I'm going to open it up to al Sheikh Again, a Kabbalist in the 16th century, it's fast. al Sheikh says like this. He has a very interesting way of reading the verse. He says, when someone um, buries his father, <coughs> this psychological pain, but also psychological per person feels that they don't have, even consciously or subconsciously, you don't have the person protected you and your youth is no longer here to protect you. So it's, it's unsettling, a parent, parents, because, because even if you're an adult now and you're self-sufficient, but you feel psychologically that, or, or subconsciously that, that, that what was your protection is no longer here. When you're the eldest, you now- You have, you have more responsibility, <laughs> correct, correct. Too. Yeah, so it's a very, very it's okay. even harder, even you're harder. Correct, correct. Says the says the, says the al -Sheikh. but what happens if someone realizes that Hashem is now my father? In other words, the role that my father provided for me, which was which was to, which was to to protect me and give me and and, and protect me. Now I have, now God Himself is going to is is going to do that role for me. Um, God is my father. That's the greatest comfort. Says the al -Sheikh, which I think is brilliant. The verse says, God blessed his son, Isaac. What does his son, Isaac mean? Who's his son? Abraham's son? We know that Isaac is Abraham's son. It could have just said, God blessed Isaac. Why do you have to say, God blessed his son, Isaac? So the al Sheikh says, his son, Isaac, his is whose? God's. God, the comfort. If we take, if we take Rashi, Rashi says that God blessing Isaac is comfort. What's the comfort? The comfort is he makes Isaac feel that Isaac is God's son, meaning the protection and the serenity and the, and the protection that you had from your father. Now you say, God is my father. And if you, if you realize that, if you internalize that, then you're gonna have that, 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 uh, that sense of comfort and sense of peace because, you're, because God is your father. And that's alluded to by saying that God blessed his son, Isaac. His son means God's son. That's the al interpretation. I thought that was unique. It's not a dangerous thing for a Jew to say after the birth of Christianity. That what? That God has a son. First of all, first of all, the verse was written before the birth of Christianity. The point is, we're all God's sons. The verses are in the Torah. You are all sons of God. There's no question about that. What does it say about um, Like he's to do a few places. So for example, in Leviticus. <clears throat> That was actually my question because we're all children of God, right? So, so why, why specifically Isaac? It says in multiple places. It says it. It says it. Well, Israel is my firstborn son, but it says it also that all Jews are God's sons, and therefore, 
And therefore, for example, it says, you are the, you, I'll, I'll find you the verse. But in any case, Vicky asks, so why just Isaac? No, the blessing is that Isaac realized it. It's true for everybody. Everybody would know that God is my protector, right? But the question is, do I, do I realize it? And if I do realize it, then that's the comfort. Because, because then I know that I'm, I'm being protected. And sometimes, like I had, my father thought I had a work ethic. Yes, yes. It's, very, it's, it's, it's a very big... you got to kind of say to yourself, well, I'm going to... And then you see miracles actually happen. Right. If you, if a person, I've had miracles because I believe right. that God is helping me to escape. Yeah. Yeah, but, but that takes, that takes, that's unnatural. Naturally is to feel that I have no protector, even though, like I said, I'm an adult and I'm self-sufficient and I didn't realize my father's a hundred years old. I didn't realize that I still have that, 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 you know, I still subconsciously, you see your father as your protector, but then then the father passes on, you feel, you feel, you feel alone. And then- But that aloneness is the thing that pushes you- To, to Hashem, yeah. But if you get the recognition, yeah, but if you get the if you get the recognition that Hashem, you're Hashem's son, then that is the comfort. That's the comfort. I thought I can do this by heart, but I can't. We'll have to go to Rabbi Google. Yeah, um, and the Deuteronomy 14. I think we'll go back to Google. Okay. <laughs> if you ask a question about the Torah, then he's uh, here, Deuteronomy 14, you are children to Hashem. They translate children, you are sons to Hashem, your God. You shall not cut yourselves and you shall not make a bold spot between your eyes for a dead person, which is very interesting. Because we're Hashem's children, therefore the son, the soul is part of God. Therefore the son, it, the soul is immortal. And therefore the mourning has to be limited. If the mourning is excessive, then you're not acknowledging that the soul lives on. Because if the soul is on, why are you why, why are you mourning excessively? We mourn because we miss the, the disease. Yeah. But if I say you, you're tearing your clothes, you're tearing your skin, and you're mourning excessively, then you're not honoring the fact that the soul lives on. So why does the soul live on? Because we're sons of Hashem, meaning our soul. Maybe that's the difference. So you're son of Hashem, maybe it means the soul. So so uh, yeah, again, of course, what is it's a metaphor. Torah, when the Torah talks about Hashem, it's metaphors, Hashem's hands, Hashem's. Hashem's eyes, Hashem's, Hashem's uh, sons means that we're an extension of God. But that, that doesn't mean the physical, doesn't mean physically, because that's, uh, that's, that's, that's like taking the, the metaphor. That your that's your neshama, yeah. I'm saying all these things, when you say God, anything physical about God, like how God has children, it, it has to be understood in metaphor because God has no, no body. Okay, let's start talking a little bit about the descendants of Yishmael, because 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 Seth is itching to go there, and so am I. Well, I find that they said. I mean, I don't know. I'm just following your kind of logic. Yes. They said him first before Isaac. Is yeah. There a reason or not? Well, in some sense, he's older, and some sense, he's more closer to Abraham. In some sense, he's a greater expression of Abraham, but still not the Jewish people. So let's we're, we're going to some of these points I said in the past because. We had this when we discussed the prophecy of the angel to Hagar about her son Yishmael. But what's interesting about this paragraph is this paragraph is the fulfillment of that prophecy. So that's why this is a significant paragraph. I'm talking about page 123. I'm going to share it in a minute. So um, let's read the last paragraph here. Last paragraph of the, of the, of the portion. So we're talking about chapter 13, right? Genesis 25, chapter 13. These are the names of the sons of Yishmael by their names, according to their births. The firstborn of Yishmael was Nevayot and Kidar and Abdel and Misam and Mishma and Duma and Masa, Hadad, Tema, Yetur, Nafish, Kedma. Beautiful. Yeah, if you, in case you're wondering who your cousins are, the sons of Yishmael, here is the list. These are the sons of Yishmael and these are the names in their open cities and in their walled cities, 12 princes um, to their nations. Okay, and then we continue. These are the years of the life of Yishmael, 100 years and 30 years and seven years, and he expired and died and was gathered to his people. And they dwelt from Chavila to Shur, which bordered Egypt, going toward Ashur. Before all his brothers, he dwelt. And that's the end of this parsha. It doesn't really say dwelt, it says nafal. It says he fell. 
he found could mean dwelt. Okay, so it's very important to, to know he has a bunch of children. He said, says where they live, there, there are 16 is interesting to talk about, and as well as 18. So we're going to try to do a little bit and see and see what, what's really happening here. So the first thing we have to understand is that the reason why the Torah tells this to us is because this is really the fulfillment of the prophecy that it was told that was told to Abraham. Um, If you turn back to page 76, 75 in the art scroll, or so that would be Genesis chapter 17. So let's see if I can do it on the screen here. So what happens at Genesis 17 is that God tells Abraham, you're gonna have a son. Sarah's gonna give a son, I have a son, Isaac. And instead of um, Abraham being very happy, what does God, God, Abraham say? He says, I, I, I just want Ishmael to live before you. Meaning he thought that it's a problem. If he's having another son, there's a problem with the first son. son. So Abraham is not too excited to hear about this great news that, he's had, that his wife Sarah is going to have another son. So, right, if you look at, at, at chapter 17, look at verse 18. So it's on the screen here. And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael will live before you, I don't need another son. I want Ishmael to live before you, meaning to be successful and to be righteous. Mm -hmm. And God said, indeed, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his seed after him. In, in, other, words, in other words, to say that, uh, so, so he will be, the covenant will be with Isaac. Nevertheless, verse 20, and regarding Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly. You ready? He will beget 12 princes, and I will make him into a great nation. Now, that's Genesis 17. What happens at Genesis 25, the page we're reading on page, uh, um, um, our, our page, which is what, 123 or something? We just told you about the descendants of Yishmael. And by the way, this is the end of Yishmael. Yishmael there's no more Yishmael on the scene. We sort of, we finished talking about Yishmael, but now we're shifting to Isaac, and now we, we, we continue about Isaac's family. So this is the, the, the parting words from Yishmael in the five books of Moses, okay? So what do we know? The verse says in verse 16, 12 princes to their nations. So you see here the prop, the fulfillment of the prophecy. Go ahead. When Joseph is put in the pit. Yes, it says Yishmael, and it also says earlier that Asaph marries the daughter of Yishmael. Fine, but I'm just saying we're not giving the lineage. We're not giving the story of Yishmael per se. Right here, we say these are the descendants of Yishmael. This is for this is Yishmael's family. The Torah is going to do the same thing, by the way, later. Once we finish the story of Jacob and Asaph, we have a whole section, a very long one. These are the descendants of Asaph. After that, we're done. We go to Jacob's children. That's the style of the Torah, right? It goes to the two sons, discusses Ishmael, finishes with Ishmael, now spends the, then it elaborates about Isaac because that's more relevant to the Jewish people. Does the same thing. Isaac has two sons, Esav and Ishmael, at some Esav and, and, and Jacob. At some point, we say these are the descendants of Jacob, of Esav, close them down and move to and move to and move to Jacob. So that's the style. So my point is here is where we, we're talking about Ishmael. So we say, yes, 12 princes. 12 princes, that's exactly what God, what God told him, so the prophecy was fulfilled. Now you understand why it has to say here. Okay, but then it happens to be they live in their open cities. That's a very interesting description. They're living in open cities. Let's see what's happening here. This is going to tie into everything we've been saying till this, this entire morning, so I hope to come full circle. I can find this, if I can find a place in the book. Oh, that, Baruch Hashem. I didn't like this translation that's on the screen, which says open cities and their walled cities. I didn't like that. I was hoping our school would save me. Our school did. Um, by their open cities, by their strongholds. Okay, so what do we know about Yishmael? We know that these are, they have 12, 12, 12 sons, 12 families, and they're living in open, 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 open cities, and they have strongholds. Um, what do, what, do I, what do I care that living in open cities happens to be? If you, if you want to conquer them, you should, go, you, should, you should know that they're in open cities as opposed to walled cities. Why is this relevant? So this is relevant because you have to go back to the first time when the angel spoke to Yishma Hagar about her son. And let's find that.
Okay, Genesis chapter 16. This is when, when, this is when Hagar was pregnant and she ran away from her, from the house of Abraham because Sarah was giving her a hard time. And she, she gets, um, what happens to her? What happens to her is that the, the angel found her on the well of the water, at the well, right? So let's see what the angel tells her. This is before Yishmael was born. So he says as follows, at verse 11 on chapter, chapter 16, so it's page 71. Um, he says like this, he says, and the angel of the, the Lord said to her, behold, you will conceive and bear a son and you shall name him Yishmael for the Lord has heard your affliction. And he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be upon all and everyone's hand upon him. And before all his brothers, he will dwell. Yishmael. Now, you read this verse, is it a positive verse or a negative verse? I'll read it again. And he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be upon all and everyone's hand upon him. And before all his brothers, uh, brothers, and before all his brothers, he will dwell. Could be a positive. Could be a positive. But, but Neil is saying no, wild ass of a man. So, 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 parada. So the conventional, that's what Rashi says. Um, she says he loves to run around and he likes to go he likes to go hunting right, uh, you know, you have yes if he has the right intent and right if it's channeled in the right way it could be good it could be a very yes um i'll be honest with you that most i think at least when we were growing up i mean i would imagine that you hear para adam a wild guy i mean para also means para means a wild in the sense like if you have a a a uh um, something that's not cultivated, the opposite of being cultivated and being channeled, right? So if you talk about their fruits that are wild fruit that are not, you can't eat because they may be poisoned, para. So para means just like in the natural state before it has been cultivated or before it has been perfected for, 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 for human consumption or before you're an animal that has not been um, um, domesticated is para. So para just means wild, like in the natural state. And we know a person in the natural state is not that great. So you take a kid, now it's nice and when you're in kindergarten, but you have to take bring them to school and show them how to say please and I'm sorry. You don't want a human being in a natural state, right? He's teachable. He's teachable, right? But 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 civilization requires us being civilized means not being in a natural state. Natural state is I don't have to worry about <clears throat> about manners and I don't have to worry about being clean. Natural state that I would live in the, in the jungle, right? No, but if you're being civilized, it's about discipline. In other words, in other words, being a mensch, growing up amongst people means you have to, you can't be in the natural state. You have to be, you have to limit yourself in many different ways. So you can read this in a positive way, you can read this in a negative way. So many people read it in a negative way. So how do they read it in a positive way? How do you read it in a positive way? The positive way is, and this touches upon, I've marked, if you're still here, this touches upon what we spoke about on Shabbos. Yishma'em is living in the, this is the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan is a descendant of Ham. Ham son of Noah was they were they were they were their culture was all, all about hierarchy all about serving others and that's why there are so many kings they invent the concept of monarchy and they invent slavery and without going into all the places where you see it in the Torah Nimrod who was the first king he's the descendants of Ham you have a small land of Israel there were nine kings in like Israel later on we know there were 31 kings so it was all about, all of society was basically one big hierarchy where everybody serves the other person. And, the, and, and, that's, and, and that is the way the people of, Kina, of, of Ham were, that includes Canaan, it also includes Egypt. And Hagar was from Egypt. We say Hagar Hamitrit. Yishmael was Abraham's son. Abraham is a descendant of shame. Shame believes in the one God and therefore believes in freedom. Because if there's one God and all people are created in the image of God, then everybody's Are equal before sure? God. Noah son. I'm going back to the previous portions. Noah son. So he's a Semite. <laughs> so Abraham is a Semite. Hagar is a, um, a from, from Egypt, which is a from Ham. Okay. So now, if you tell me Yishmael cannot be civilized, he can't limit himself to one place to live under the civilization, especially the, the, the civilization of Canaan. Instead, what you're saying about Yishmael is he's a free spirit. If you read that verse, he's a free spirit. He's not interested in any obligation. He doesn't want any, 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 he doesn't want any society to force him to live in a certain way. And that's why where does he hang out? 
open cities and he's out in the wild. And that's why his descendants don't settle. We're gonna talk about that in the, in, in the last, when it says in our verse, the verse that we're reading here, when it says that the last, the last verse of the page, over all his brothers he dwelt. In other words, they dwelt from Havilah to Shur, which is near Egypt, toward Assyria, over all his brothers he dwelt. Meaning he's not in one place. He is all over the place. He's not limiting himself to one area because to limit yourself in one area is discipline and Abraham and limitation. And um, the spirit of Abraham as expressed through Yishmael is freedom. Freedom because we're all created by the one God and therefore nobody can limit me and no one can tell me what to do. And that's, and, and that's Yishmael and that's beautiful. And that's a legitimate expression of the, I, the belief system of Abraham. That there's a one God and therefore, we don't have to be subject to anybody except for God. Now, if you're living in society, you have to be. If you're living in a city, you have to be subject to somebody else. You have to stop at the red light because we have too many people here. So if everyone does what they want, they're going to crash. So if you're living, to, you're living in a city, you have to limit yourself to other people. And you have to subjugate yourself to other people. He didn't want to do that. Why? Because from him, it was an expression of a spiritual feeling of freedom. And that was Yishmael. And that was, Yishmael, and that was a legitimate expression of Abraham. What do we know about Isaac? We'll talk about that next week. Isaac is, has, has, the, has the belief system of Abraham, but also the discipline of Sarah. And the discipline means that you have to be disciplined to better the world, to serve Hashem. 613, command, 613 commandments. You're free in the sense that you're not subject to a human being, but you're not free in the sense that you have to be very disciplined to serve God. And that's the Jewish people. But the point here, the point of this whole thing is that the fact that Yishmael cannot sit still and cannot, cannot, cannot create a civilization and is roaming and, and he's at, he, and, and you know, the Arabian tribes that descend from Yishmael were always um, nomads, right? There's something to that. And according to some of the commentators, this is actually an expression of the Abraham spirit. Abraham also couldn't sit still. Abraham was also traveling and preaching and didn't want to live within civilization. There's a certain freedom that you get when you leave civilization. And that's, a, and, and that's an expression of the belief in God. But a Jew is not just belief in God. That's the Muslims. The Muslims got the belief in God from Abraham. A Jew is the belief in God together with the discipline and together with the obligation to follow God's commandments in a very specific prescribed way, which is to bring God into this world in a very specific way. So for the Jew, you need Abraham and you need Sarah. When you get to, when you get to Yishmael, his connection to Abraham is all is the freedom aspect. And that's why you leave me these verses. We know he's open, living in open cities. We know he is living in a very wide area, which means he's not living in one place. And the, 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 the final point here is the end, and we'll conclude with this because I'm going four minutes over, but the final word of this parsha is over all his brothers he dwelt. Now that's not a perfect translation. Literally it says over all his brothers he fell. It's not a very interesting, not a clear verse what that means. There are multiple interpretations. What does it mean he fell? If Rashi's, we'll get to that next week. But one interpretation fell. When you say you fall somewhere, it means you don't belong here. If you're the nomad, wherever you are, you fell. In Yiddish, is, how, do you, how, how do you fall in here? I mean, like, like, how do you get here, right? So the point is, when they were traveling, they had no specific place. Wherever they went, they were moving around. And therefore, they would not, didn't belong any specific place. And that's what God tells he, um, his mother, his mother, the Egyptian woman who was living in a society that was all about hierarchy. And he says, no, your son will be like Abraham in the sense that he's going to be wild. He's going to be everywhere. He's not going to limit himself to one place. He's going to be free. That's the story in short. Everybody's welcome to stay on uh, at least another five minutes to debate. And then unfortunately, or fortunately, we have to take a break for, until next week. Rabbi, does that also describe the Jewish people going from place to place? Yes, but we, first of all, the goal of the Jewish people was to settle. And only when we were in exile, we had to go from place to place. But wherever we go, we try to settle. And that's why you look at Isaac's life. The one thing you know about Isaac's life is agriculture, unlike Abraham. In that sense, he's very different than his father. No, we're, we're he's, 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 he's digging wells. Okay, so Isaac is all about trying to settle in one place because Isaac is the discipline. And the Jewish people, there's no question that our life is about freedom in the sense that we don't serve other people, but you cannot say that the Jewish people are a wild ass of a man. In other words, as a culture, we are the opposite. We're very, at least the religion, is very disciplined. And it's supposed to be about 
applying your belief system in a very specific way. And for Yishmael, it can't happen. Yishmael is too free-spirited. Well, that free-spiritedness is a beautiful thing, and it comes from Abraham. And we also have some of it, but we need the balance. And the balance that we have is from Abraham and Sarah together. And that's why we're the Jewish people. And that's why we have to be the heir, not, not Yishmael, even though it seems Yishmael is more similar to his father than we are, than Isaac is, right? But, 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 to, create, but, but to create the Jewish people, you need, a mer- you, need a, you, need, you need a combination of both Abraham and Sarah. So that's the story in short. Yashikar. Yashikar. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.